Good morning and welcome to another live stream on the Practical IT channel. My name is Jeremy, I'm your host and benevolent dictator for life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm on my third cup of coffee so I'm, I'm feeling, a, feeling a little bit uh, caffeinated this morning. Uh, so, uh, I have a few things to cover today. Good morning, David. I have a few things to cover today, and I'm going to try to keep this fairly short. Uh, I do have to make a trip down to Chicago, actually north of Chicago, and back uh, this afternoon slash evening with my dad uh, related to his business. And... Um, so yeah, I, I need to get uh, through this and get mentally prepped for eight hours in a car and uh, a couple of hours uh, uh, down in the Illinois area. So it should be an adventure. Uh, thankfully, I have, uh, I, I convinced the old man to... Uh, let me put the put his license plate on my iPass, so I we don't have to stop and pay toll. It's all done electronically, and uh, he'll be able to settle up with me later. <laughs> all right, so um, switch over to my notes. All right, so. Uh, trying to keep with my format that I'm trying to, to lock myself into. Some notable news from the last two weeks uh, since the last live stream. Uh, Sir Clive Sinclair, uh, the uh, British mastermind behind the ZX Spectrum, and yes, I'll pronounce it that way purposely because that's the way the Brits pronounce it. Uh, uh, died at age 81. Uh, Canonical, the people behind Ubuntu, have extended support on Ubuntu 14.04 and 16.04, which are the LTS versions, to 10 full years. So you can use and get support for 14.04 uh, until 2024. So that's a nice announcement. AMD has announced that it stands by and is ready to produce ARM and or RISC-V chips, depending on what its customers want. So that's uh, interesting. I wondered when they were going to get back on the ARM bandwagon. I figured it was only a matter of time with the moves that Apple has been making and uh, even Microsoft with their Surface uh, tablet slash laptop convertible, whatever you want to call that monstrosity. So uh, the next article I found that was interesting, an article from The Verge reports that professors are seeing the rise of a generation that cannot understand the basics of how computers and operating systems work. So, apparently, younger adults, uh, kids getting out of high school and entering the college uh, arena, uh, are not coming to the table with basic skills like directory structures and how to save files and find files and they're being left not knowing where they save something. So that's uh, troubling, in my opinion. It seems like such a basic thing and something that's been drilled into my head over the years. And uh, for these uh, young people not to know that, uh, it seems like they're, they're setting themselves up to have to make up some knowledge uh, when they get to college, so, uh, and no, I did not mean to rhyme that. <laughs> okay, the European Union proposes mandatory 
USB-C on all mobile devices, including iPhones. Uh, I understand Apple is not too thrilled about this. But it's a win for consumers. So uh, in this instance, I will say, too bad, Apple. Uh, the first RISC-V computer chip lands at the European Processor Initiative. Uh, this is for testing. Uh, so this is an actual silicon chip, and um, they have done some early testing. The previous testing that they had done was uh, an FPGA implementation of the RISC-V instruction set. Uh, and that implementation had been booting Linux. Uh, my understanding from the article is that the the actual uh, early run chip uh, has only had some very basic testing on it, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. I've been I've been keeping an eye on the Risk Five since it is a completely open source design. And uh, with Apple's announcement that they are looking at this and monitoring the progress on it, uh, who knows if they will stick with ARM long term or if, you know, the, the Apple Silicon label will be uh, used as a blanket title for future chips that are RISC-V based, or maybe they'll use it as a support chip, uh, which is entirely possible as well. Okay, Ubuntu 21.10 beta is available for download. There is a new SQLite tutorial available on linuxconfig.org. And a couple of items that aren't really new but new to me uh there is a project called noco db n-o-c-o-d-b and it's an open source project to turn an instance or installation of mysql postgresql sql server sqlite or maria db into a smart spreadsheet this is similar to what airtable does uh, and this project already has mobile apps for iOS and Android. So this is something that I'm kind of watching. I've dabbled with Airtable over the years. I think it's a very interesting project, especially for people that need something more than what they can realistically do in Excel. Uh, and yet a database, a full database, is over their head. Uh, also, not new in the past two weeks, but something worthy of checking out if you are, in fact, running Linux. Uh, Ventoy, which is a project that I've covered before, uh, the Linux version now comes with a graphical interface. And this is an actual native graphical interface. It's not the uh, web interface that had come with it. Uh, you are not limited anymore to the web interface or the command line version. You can use a graphical interface and it basically operates the same as the Windows version does. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the news segment. Let me check on uh, the chat um, <laughs> yes David uh, uh, the young ones are too busy with social media garbage um, I'm sure they know how to swipe everything on their smartphones <laughs> yeah pretty much that's that's the way things are going uh, unfortunately Parents are putting um, touchscreen devices in the hands of kids when they're, you know, six months old and up, and that's what they natively know, and anything beyond that is whew, right over their heads. 
Um, so, good morning, Tony. Welcome. Um, uh, David, I see you're headed to LA on Tuesday. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get my ticket to Vid Summit. I, uh, due to some other requests for time off, I did not get to request this uh, couple of days off for Vid Summit for this week. Uh, and I'm not sure um, the time I would be able to spend on it is worth the price tag for the, the virtual version. Uh, but I do look forward to hearing about it um, in, in a future video. I hope you'll talk about it in a future video. So, uh, let's see. All right. So, announcements for today. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, or close to the beginning, the stream is going to be a little bit shorter. So I'm trying to rush through a few things right now so I can spend a little bit more time on a couple of other things. Uh, I'm looking to wrap this up between 12.15 and 12.30 uh, because I do have to make a trip with my dad to the Chicago area this afternoon, so that's going to be a bunch of driving. Uh, at this point, the live stream is going to continue on a bi-weekly basis. The next planned live stream is going to be Sunday, October 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm also working on guests for upcoming live streams. And so there is a possibility that this will throw my bi-weekly schedule off. And I may make an exception if that's what works for the other people for uh, guest appearances. And so... Um, couple people that I've been talking with um, a guy by the name of Tim that I used to work with he was the IT manager at the uh, vocational college I taught at uh, which uh, said vocational college is now officially out of business so uh, he's uh, uh, Express some interest to possibly come on uh, that live stream would probably have something a little bit more to do with Windows uh, because that's his sort of um, specialty and uh, perhaps he'll be on with um, one of his former um, I don't know if you call it a lackey or a minion or <laughs> um, uh, a, a, a student helper type person. Um, so uh, turns out that this, uh, this student who is just uh, starting his first job recently has actually seen my fog videos uh, or at least one of them. So that's, that's kind of exciting to get somebody on again that has seen my videos or a few of my videos anyways uh, and is willing to come on and and share some experiences uh, okay the other thing and I'm gonna paste this into chat here momentarily uh, I have started setting up a space on matrix uh, which for those who are not in the know, Matrix is similar to um, Discord and Slack, etc. Um, only it's open source and it's end-to-end -end encrypted. And after a lot of deliberation over this, I set up a space, which is, you know, their terminology. I've created a general room in there, and uh, that's where I will be spending some time. Not today, necessarily, 
Uh, I'm not sure if I've got the app on my phone yet, but uh, the um, the recommended app uh, for most people is uh, let's see, Element. Um, there is a web-based interface for this as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's um, what I've decided to do for a uh, sort of chat environment for this. I will be adding additional rooms. Um, let me see if I can bring this up. Um, let's see, share, share screen. So, uh, I have pasted the, uh, link directly to my space, um, on, on the matrix server. And like I said, I've only got the general, um, room open at the moment uh, so my plan with this is to hopefully after the after the live streams to, to keep the conversation going for 30 minutes 45 minutes starting with uh, the next live stream um, and then I may be hanging out in here a couple nights a week um, and I will be monitoring it for uh, questions and, and different things like that. So uh, that's where I've decided to go. I, I don't know, something about Slack and Discord just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And after looking at a bunch of videos and reading more than I care to admit about these different chat type uh, applications uh, matrix is what I settled on so um, that's uh, where we're at on that take a look at my notes again and see if there was anything else I wanted to mention here um, Oh, yes. Uh, the other detail on this is that, like I said, this is currently running on a public server. So know that you're uh, going into this, you are at the mercy of the terms of service of the public server. However, I am contemplating spinning up and it probably won't happen until early 2022, but uh, spinning up a VPS instance and running Element on that. And that will be completely mine. And uh, again, something that I will, I will support through contributions to the channel and whatnot. So... Uh, look for that at the beginning of 2022. So, um, all right, so let's minimize that and come on over here. So, okay. Now, apparently... I lost connection to my camera. Uh, huh. Well, there it goes. Not sure why that happened, but we'll work with it. Okay. Either of you see my bee kissing video about Micro Center this morning, uh, trying to lay the groundwork for a sponsorship. Uh, I saw about the first half of it. Uh, I ran that on my phone while I was 
finishing my setup uh, for this live stream. Uh, and uh, I will likely watch the rest of it while I'm finishing my prep for the Chicago trip. So, let's see. Uh, hold that thought. I've got a phone call coming in. All right, sorry about that. Um, my uh, my dad called wanting some details on the trip. So I did get his Garmin updated. <laughs> that was an adventure. I love these. Oh, by the way, you need to insert an SD card to get in the new maps situations. <laughs> All right, so... Let's see. Lorenzo, hello. Um, have you ever set up a fog server service on your network? Um, I don't know what you necessarily mean by a fog server service. I've had fog server running on my network, which is all... I really need to consider it a service. Uh, if, if you have something else in mind, uh, please feel free to clarify. Um, I don't normally keep it up all the time, uh, but I try to, I try to uh, spin up, spin it up uh, in, in the VM a couple times a year. Uh, maybe quarterly and do updates on it and do a little bit of quick testing to make sure everything is working. Um, but um, Fog has been slowing down their development lately. So I've not been doing quite as much with it. With that being said, um, I was lurking in their forums I don't know, a week and a half ago. And the developers that are left on the project uh, were suggesting people consider running the development version. Uh, I'm hoping that they will um, get a new production ready version out uh at some point this fall uh but it has been over a year now since they last updated fog as far as the production version 159 was released on september 13th of 2020 excuse me now you know if if um, 
if fog still serves your needs and it's something that you use on a regular basis, um, I'm not ready to recommend abandoning it yet. Uh, but it's one of those situations where since the development has slowed down, I would recommend starting to investigate other solutions in case they decide to pull the plug at some point and another group of developers doesn't pick it up. Um, so, uh, with that being said, I am uh, outlining, I've been outlining for a while, uh, an updated uh, series of videos, two to three videos on the fog project that will likely be out October, November timeframe. Uh, and it will go over installing the, the development version and testing that and, um, discussing any oddities I might discover in that testing. Okay, so we're about 30 minutes in, and so I wanted to take a look at uh, Ubuntu 21.10 Beta. I'll get this started up, and then I will switch over here and take my self off the screen and bump that up. So I got 2110 installed. Uh, I have noticed a couple of odd things about it. Uh, but it is still beta. It's not even made it to release candidate status yet. Um, so I uh, don't think this is a huge release in terms of features that they've brought to this new version. So All right, so we've got a pretty standard looking Ubuntu screen. They stuck with their color scheme. They put the new logo, character, whatever you want to call it on the background. Um, they do have their decent set of wallpapers. Kind of like this one here. So the, the new things that they pointed out, um, activities has a new look in GNOME 40. So you've got your different desktops here. Um, this is still sort of that adaptive multi-desktop type of uh, situation that they've uh, had for a while. It will always create one more desktop than what you are actually using. Um, other things that the release notes for this said, there's a new divider on the dock uh, and a, an updated trash can icon. The new horizontal app launcher. So again, uh, they're kind of taken from the the Mac sort of vision on this, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's uh, definitely more polished than the Windows 10 version. I would I would argue. Um, 
So horizontal app launcher, the Snap Store has been updated. Now I will say the first time you run this, this is going to sit and pull things down and it's going to take quite some time and you'll probably think that it's hung. Um, this took 20-25 minutes on this VM to do that. Uh, but it did finally populate things and so I think most of these are populated at the moment. Uh, of course I click on one that's not. There it goes. So I do still like the the uh, way they've got this broken down into categories. I like the fact that they highlight recently updated apps. Uh, again, when this populates uh, other release notes, they have said that uh, Firefox, Thunderbird, and LibreOffice have been updated to the latest versions. Uh, some apps were backported from GNOME 41, and we can. Calendar is one of them. Of course, it's it's hard to tell at just a uh, visual inspection. But if we go into about, uh, we can see that it's version 41 beta. Um, we can jump back to activities. We can move to the next screen. Um, the other apps that they say were new, uh, GNOME Discs, again, if we look at the About, uh, release, uh, bleh, GNOME Disk Utility 41 Release Candidate, so I'm not sure what they updated it uh, on this, but uh, uh, yeah, so that's probably it's just a, a change from GTK3 to GTK4. Uh, and the final one they list as being backported um, is System Monitor. So again, nothing terribly uh, exciting here but if we do about system monitor it is 41 release candidate as far as <coughs> excuse me as far as odd behavior I've seen um, I've seen come up a couple of times with uh, internal errors being listed. Uh, when I tried to submit that to the Ubuntu team, it did not go through. And so that's a little perplexing. And... Um, I'm hoping that they'll have that figured out by the time they get some release candidates available. Um, so that's um, that's uh, pretty much wraps up my first Linux segment of the show. Um, I'm going to I don't know let's take myself or put myself back on at least in the small uh, area so let's look at chat messages and see what uh, what we've got here uh, sorry I meant a fog server on your network I've noticed that the cloning part works quite well tried it on my test corporate network with gigabit ubiquity switches and fiber backbones uh, so yes, um, I have 
Uh, I don't keep it up and running all the time, uh, but I have used it for several things on my network, and I have found that it works quite well. So, um, uh, and Pat, welcome. I'm a beginner, and my friend is coming over. We're going to try to upload uh, Linux Cinnamon Mint. Um, would that still be the best option for me? So, uh, that's a great question, Pat. Um, so, Mint is considered one of the more user-friendly Linux distributions. Um, starting, uh, well, uh, let me back up. Uh, Linux Mint is based on or built on top of Ubuntu. Uh, many people find that Mint is more user-friendly. Uh, there are a few things that I nitpick about uh, with, with, uh, mint, uh, but, uh, for new users, it's something you probably won't notice too much. So, uh, I'm, I'm coming at this from more than 20 years of using Linux. Uh, so I'm not always the best person to give advice to brand new users. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions along the way. So, um, you know, mint cinnamon is, is easy to use. I've used that in the past myself, um, uh, for day-to-day -day use. I still like pop OS, uh, but that is aimed a little bit more at a power user uh, and generally I, I don't know you could make the the argument that it's great for new users as well uh, it looks nice it's I find it user friendly I, I guess this is a your mileage may vary type of situation uh, but yeah I mean the great thing about Linux is that you can start somewhere and start learning the system and you can start, you know, after say six months down the road, you might want to try something else out. So you back up your data and you install the next thing that interests you. Uh, the great part of it is that it's free. You know, it's not going to cost you anything to, you know, go from Mint to Pop! OS or what have you down the road uh, and if you decide you don't like that one you can always go back my recommendation would be however to have a uh, a backup drive so that you can dump your data onto it uh, or uh, and and your friend may may already be taking this into consideration use something like uh, clonezilla to clone the whole disk uh, and that way if you decide you want to go back uh, you can restore your mint system exactly as it was the day that you did the image backup uh, and again don't worry if some of this terminology is over your head at the moment um, you know your friend that's going to help you install Linux uh, likely will know what I'm talking about uh, and you can have him or her take a look at this video and and uh, you know if they want clarification on something I've said and uh, hopefully hopefully that will give them you know a little bit of clarification uh, so, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, thank you, Lorenzo, for the congrats. I 
yeah, I've been doing this for, well, since 2017. Um, and, you know, as the community grows around the channel, I'm, I'm enjoying this more and more. Um, as of this morning, we're at uh, 2,720 something subscribers. And it's, it's always interesting to see how it kind of grows in spurts and, and, uh, you know, people come for different reasons and, and ask different questions and it's, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, all right. So... I think I covered the difference between Ubuntu <coughs> and Mint. Um, so it's Linux, L-I-N-U-X, uh, not Linux, like the furnace people. Um, so um, yeah, um, Linux is sort of the core piece of what um, builds an operating system. So even Windows has a kernel or a core component. Uh, around that you've got different uh, utilities and applications that make it into a full operating system. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, um, there are a lot of good videos out there. Uh, I've not done one in depth in a while. If I've actually made this video um, explaining, you know, you know how the the operating system is built up. I, again, this is generally stuff that new users don't need to know right away uh at least not new users in 2021 now back in 27 uh 1997 when i started it with linux using various linux distributions it was a different different ball game so uh but i i won't i won't inflict upon you uh all of the trials and tribulations of of the early adopter phase of of the uh, of Linux distributions. The great thing is now they're very polished and um, really depending on what you're using it for, a lot of people could use Linux, especially those who are used to using Chromebooks or tablets, uh, because those systems do not have uh, the ability to run Windows applications, and so that argument kind of goes out the window. So, um, 97 was past the console only era, um, but the, the, uh, oh, the, uh, window managers available at the time were pretty crude looking, uh, shall we say. Um, that was still, still a time when we were, uh, marching uphill, uh, trying to fight the battle of getting vendors to support Linux and, um, have drivers available even for things like sound cards and printers and, and things of that nature. Um, it, it was, it was a battle, um, today 
things pretty much just work. Uh, and let me get out of this. And if you look at, you know, something like system76.com, and no, this video is not sponsored by them, but I, I do have a, an admiration for the company as a whole. Um, if you look at System76 and the products they have, uh, anything from mini desktops uh, built on the Intel NUC platform to laptops to desktops with custom uh, casing um, to servers um, you know this is the company behind pop OS um, we've come a long way in, in 97 and you know up through 2005 ish it was it was quite difficult and painful to get uh, most Linux distributions to run on a laptop and have it work in a usable fashion. And today you have companies like System76 bringing out customized laptops that run Linux natively. And these aren't just your, you know, two generation old things. These are current generation so we've got 11th generation Intel and, um, you know, 5000 series Ryzen uh, in these laptops. Uh, and, you know, like any other computer company, um, the, the, the plague has uh, slowed things down. They are still reliant on uh, some components to come from overseas. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have to make some decisions. Uh, but one nice thing that they've done with their, their motherboard customizations is that you don't have to be locked into the proprietary UEFI BIOS uh, that any other PC would have. Uh, they use uh, Core Boot, which is a Linux-based um, replacement for the UEFI BIOS. Uh, there are some other tweaks that are available. Um, and the other, the other cool thing is um, they have uh, for their to, to build out their manufacturing, uh, which is U.S. based, by the way, um, they have um, uh, they have designed their own keyboard. This is a customizable keyboard, and it will work with. Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. The utility, the configuration utility, works with Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. Uh, and no, I'm not just saying Linux first because I like Linux better. I am saying Linux first because it comes first in the alphabet and I, I'm doing them in proper order. Um, so, um, there's their keyboard. Now, you'll likely get some sticker shock when you see the price on this keyboard, and it's even a 10 keyless keyboard. Uh, but it is built in Colorado. It does have RGB, and you can change your RGB on any platform you desire. Um, it does have does not have a Windows key on it. It has the super key, uh, which would be equivalent to the Windows key uh, or the command key on a Mac. 
Uh, you can change the layout of these keyboards. You can do all kinds of things. Um, with the split space bar, if you so desired, you can make one of the space bar halves a backspace key. Um, and then you didn't have don't have to stretch your pinky up here to the backspace. So that's that's kind of nice, but it comes at a price. <laughs> um, they, but it is it is an open source design now. <laughs> design and buy. Uh, you can select your switches, and I would go with the the jade which are the clicky. You can extend the warranty to three years for parts and labor for $35. Um, and uh, shipping coverage. Okay. $285 without the extended warranty. So again, it's pricey, but uh, keyboard enthusiasts, um, like their keyboards and you know if it means that you buy the keyboard once and you have easy access to customize it and replace switches and things of that nature uh, there are people out there that would be willing to pay $285 for a keyboard uh, I am curious about this but not $285 dollars curious yet maybe in 2022 <laughs> maybe <laughs> but i i'm i'm not gonna i'm not gonna promise my viewers that i'm gonna buy one of these uh currently so uh but definitely if you're looking to buy a, a computer especially a laptop uh i would recommend at least taking a look at these um, I, I'm really curious about the new MacBook Pros that are supposed to be coming out in October or uh, announced in October anyways. Uh, but at the same time, since they have moved to the ARM platform uh, and I've got an M1 Mac Mini mainly for my editing and live streaming, I am very much tempted to uh, grab something like the Pangolin 15, um, which is a pretty reasonable price, uh, and be able to still run a Windows VM on it if the um, situation calls for that. So, but you can get up to, you know, a workstation class machine, and these, of course, are not available at the moment. Um, you know, I would, currently myself, I would, I would be looking at the AMD version. So, um, Radeon graphics, up to 64 gigs of memory, up to 2 terabytes of NVMe. Yeah, I mean, and these are fully upgradable, like as in user serviceable machines. So I can buy it with a smaller uh, amount of NVMe and memory in it and upgrade it myself after I have it. And opening the case does not void the warranty. <laughs> so... <laughs> That is that is a very attractive thing to me. Um, so yeah, and uh, if you're looking for somebody that has System76 products, uh, Jay at Learn Linux TV has, um, I believe, both the laptops and a desktop from System76 and. Leo Laporte at twit.tv uh, has uh, claimed, I saw him in a, a live stream earlier this week, he claimed that 
uh, he has purchased at least five different devices from System76 in the past five years. Uh, they actually had one of the guys from System76 on Foss Sleep Weekly, um, which... Maybe I can find that video and throw in in the uh, um, in the chat. So let me mute the tab and grab this. So throw that in the the chat. So that video is it's kind of long. I think it's an hour, uh, but well worth the the listen. And, um, yeah, yeah, check that out. So, um, all right, let's catch up on the chat a little bit. Uh, I remember when one gig memory was amazing and expensive. Yep, I remember that as well. Um, I've seen some for as much as $700. I'd have to be well over a million subs before I consider an expense like that for a keyboard. <clears throat> well, uh, I like my clicky keyboards, and I know a keyboard like that uh, it would be a, it, it would be a an investment that I would look at something that I would depreciate over five or more years. Um, and you know, eh, that's not what I wanted. Uh, $285 over five years is $54 a year. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, the, uh, clicky keyboards I've got now. These are rather inexpensive. I think I paid around $80 a piece for them. I've got one here on my desk. And I've got one at work on my desk because I, I didn't like the lack of travel in the keys on the keyboard I'd been provided at work. Um, and I, I approached that situation with a uh, ask forgiveness rather than permission type of approach and I just bought it and took it into work, uh, and my boss didn't say boo about it. So, <laughs> um, but that's one of the the benefits of working in a small uh, organization. So, uh, other places might not be so willing to let you bring in your own hardware. Of course. Uh, when I was just about to graduate with my undergraduate degree, I did a, a job shadow at the state of Michigan and uh, with, with a, a guy that I've known for long time. Um, <laughs> and and uh, as he took me around and showed me some different things, um, you, you know, there was one guy in his department that had brought a custom built computer in and uh have i lost my video again uh maybe woohoo okay well i guess we'll cut me off um hopefully you can all still hear me <laughs> uh but yeah uh seems seems video is not cooperating with me today um, but yeah, this guy at the state of Michigan had brought in his own, um, computer that he had built, uh, and was using it for work at the state of Michigan. So I don't know how that got past the management, but, uh, that did happen. Um, myself, my big thing at, at work has been, you know, sneaking in a little bit of Linux, um, and I guess that's a good segue to talk a little bit about uh, Uptime Kuma. Uh, so this is just a little monitoring um, 
app. I've got it running in Docker on a Linux VM. And I can see at a glance, you know, if my various machines are in fact up on my network. Now, this by itself in a web browser may not be the most useful thing in the world, but, excuse me, my longer term goal is to have this dashboard um, available on a on a uh, Raspberry Pi running Screenly, which is a digital signage uh, software application. And so it'll just rotate anything I program on that for, for uh, slides, I suppose you could call them, but it allows you to do uh, web-based items as slides. So I could have this rotating and, you know, put a monitor with a Raspberry Pi up on a shelf. And at a glance, I can be able to see, oh, everything's up. It looks good. And, you know, move on. Now, I could add things. These are all items that are on my local network. But if I wanted to, I could add... Um, I could add Google and save that. And just like that, it starts monitoring google.com to verify that that's up. Now you get the little notifications down here in the bottom right corner. If something goes down, uh, it's going to be big old red uh, notifications popping up and keeping you notified of things. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's been a nice little, um, project to play with, to start down the path of getting that prepped and ready to go. Um, in settings, it does have a light mode which is almost painful to look at um, and you can change the heartbeat bar to the bottom of each item or you could turn it off uh, or you could say normal um, does let you set the time zone change your password uh, and then you can export which is something new in in the 162 version and of course you can clear all your statistics so um, otherwise I mean you can clear statistics by um, item so it does give you the the option to clear events and clear heartbeats uh, which is which is all right so but yeah, that's that's a interesting little little tool. Um, okay, let's catch up on chat some more. My next big spend will be on a high-end laptop that I can use for video editing and live streaming while I'm traveling. Yep. Uh, so I've found course you know I dabble in Max and and other things as well so I found that you know my MacBook Pro from 2014 is still holding its own for for live streaming uh, of course I got it with the i7 uh, 16 gigs of RAM maxed out in a terabyte of storage um, but the, the bottleneck I've always found is more upload speed for streaming. And that, when it's on a solid network, uh, like down at my buddy's place in Illinois, um, 
I stream over Wi-Fi at his place. Of course, he's got gig internet, too. And so, you know, it's, uh, um, it's done all right. But since it is seven years old, I'm, I'm looking at probably in 2022, I'll be replacing that machine. Um, and then, uh, you know, at some point I will get another MacBook Pro, I'm sure, but that's going to be another couple years off. I have a couple of clicky keyboards that cost $75, and I thought that was a lot. Uh, <laughs> you should look at some of the gaming keyboards. Uh, those are those are insane. Um, uh, just just as an example, um, let's see. Let's do four stars and up. And especially if you get into some of the uh, name brand ones. Uh, start at $100 and go up from there. Um, so Logitech at 179 and there's there's all kinds of stuff av available Razer Huntsman version 2 at $200 and there are some others out there that are just like <laughs> insanely they're like $2000 keyboards uh but they're they're uh have typewriter style keys on them or key caps anyways um, but yeah there's there's a lot of stuff out there for keyboards that um, if we do high to low uh, yeah there's a $1,300 keyboard Logitech $789 six hundred and fifteen dollars these are some of these are just nuts just completely nuts but uh, g810 Orion spectrum RGB that's a brand I've never even heard of so yeah um, so the other the other thing with the keyboards you've got the the DOS keyboard which would be a solid choice uh, the thing I like about this is that um, you can get these with um, can get these without the the uh, printed keys uh, but you know some of these are starting you know 179 199 which you know not bad in the grand scheme of things but if you really want something custom Uh, the happy hacking keyboard. Nope, that's not it. Um, there was a, so I've had one of these in the past, but the long past, uh, I actually, I think I've still got it, but I, I ended up with a PS2 model because that's how long ago it was. Um, but these were one of the first Linux oriented keyboards that were on the market. Um, and then what was the other one? The, um, um, oh, 
Oh yeah, the ultimate hacking keyboard. So this is this is <laughs> slick. Um, you can separate the the sides of the keyboard. Uh, you can have a wood grain wrist rest. Um, you can you've got detachable options for the key clusters. Um, I mean this this thing is not cheap um, and there's a waiting list for them uh, so these are the ultimate hacking keyboard 60 key version 2 production uh, earliest orders ship in September new orders are expected to ship January 2022 uh, they do give you several options for uh, switch types and I'm not sure if they even give you a price so let's just add to cart and see how much we're looking at so even this is $275 and I, I'm just I'm kind of uh, on the fence whether to get something like this just for the the cool factor or to go with the the built-in colorado um keyboard from system 76 but i i don't know i'm i'm i've become more of a keyboard snob in recent years uh because i spent a bunch of years on just mushy garbage keyboards and um i'm trying to think about you, you know avoiding carpal tunnel and some of these things and yeah it's uh taking me down the rabbit hole <laughs> uh all right uh during our regulator audit last week in utica new york i brought my own camera for webex yeah i believe it uh neat little network monitoring tool thanks for sharing uh you're welcome and just for the sake of argument, update Kuma. Um, uh, ah, up time Kuma is the name of it. <laughs> uh, so, it's going to take me there. There we go. So I'll paste this in, and there are walkthroughs. <clears throat> uh, the guy that the guy that I've been watching quite a bit lately on YouTube is awesome open source, uh, and um he some of the stuff that he does especially with docker is pretty amazing and um he did a he did an uptime kuma uh walkthrough for setup and it just it just works it just works so i've got um Portainer and Uptime Kuma running on this particular uh, Docker instance on an Ubuntu server VM, and it's just it just runs. It's it's great. It's uh, simple and fairly quick to get set up, especially if you use his uh, Docker setup script uh, that's on his GitHub. Uh, but yeah, uh, I will likely be featuring some of his work in upcoming videos, uh, because that's, that's pushed me forward on, on, uh, Docker and, uh, you know, credit where credit's due. Uh, that's the way I like doing things. Uh, keyboards only last me about 18 months. Oh, let's see. One cup of coffee, tears. 
Um, not something I'll be reviewing unless I get it for free. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. In a future product, I want to add a Raspberry Pi to my network rack that will have a seven inch showing network activity. Need to do some research. Yeah, so um, Docker runs on the Raspberry Pi and you can run Uptime Kuma in Docker on the Raspberry Pi. So uh, something, something worth considering there, I guess. Um, uh, potentially you could run screenly on that with Docker uh, or in parallel with Docker uh, and have have uh, Uptime Kuma all on a standalone Pi. Um, I, I'm really kind of waiting on purchasing more Pi stuff until the um, the compute module fours are, are back and available a little more widely than what they are currently. Um, I think we talked about this last week, but um, many of the higher end options for, for the CM4 uh, are out of stock. And it seems like they, they uh, tend to be uh, out of stock quite a bit lately. So, um, the compute module for, I would want would be, would have wireless, the eight gig of Ram module, uh, with 32 gigs of EMMC and of course available from a U.S. distributor. Um, and that by itself, they're saying at $150, but, uh, that gets you away from the issues with the compact flash uh, or not compact flash the micro SD cards on the standard boards um, Wow and this is saying it's the 4 gig model with no EMMC um, yeah that's not what I specified in the little wizard go figure um, Let's see what uh, these other distributors have available. So I want eight gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of storage with the EMMC. So it's either going to be wireless. There we go. So eight gigs wireless, eight gigs, 32 EMMC. Uh, it's going to be this mod model. That's ninety dollars. Um, that might actually be in stock at PieShop.us. And then of course I'll need a carrier board which is essentially uh, like a motherboard. And so this uh, has a real-time clock, just bring your own battery, uh, spot for the, the uh, compute module four and even a X1 uh, PCI Express. So that's kind of kind of uh, neat and something that I'm I'm very hopeful I can get my hands on in the next month or two excuse me um, I'd like to show some Samba 80 stats as well uh, I'm sure there are ways you can do that I'm sure there are ways you can do that I've not uh, done that with Samba before, but I'm sure there are options out there. So, 
I'm going to try it in Docker on the Synology NAS. Very nice. I uh, if you if you get that running, and you do a video on it. I will definitely be in line to watch that video. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so the last thing, um, I guess I got myself off on a tangent uh, for the other stuff, but um, I'm going to shut this down. Um, okay, so it wants me to log in again in order to shut down. So let's do it this way and then we'll shut it down. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is that um, RescueZilla and Redo Rescue. So I took a look at uh, Redo Rescue first, and they have not put out an update in getting close to a year now. Uh, Redo Rescue was earlier this year in June, and I read on their website uh, or their GitHub page, I read somewhere that they're on a six month release schedule. So that should put their next release out about December of this year. So um, that led me to, uh, it's a 60 gig hard drive, so I need to add another 60 gig. Uh, that led me to looking through some of the notes on on Redo Rescue, and they mentioned a project called uh, Fox, Fox clone, uh, which is a similar project in some ways, but there are things that it doesn't do that both RescueZilla and Redo Rescue will do. So I'm going to add another SCSI drive and I'm going to put that on, once this populates, put that on local, and I'm going to make that, I'm going to make that a 65 gig, just to give myself a little wiggle room. And so, hopefully that works the way I want it to. Um, so I did download the Fox, the Fox, uh, clone ISO and we can boot that up here. Um, and whether I'll do the clone or not, I, I don't know, but we will, we will boot this up just for the sake of argument. Um, I need to check. Uh, boot order and I need to move the optical up okay so this is kind of interesting the the Fox clone is kind of interesting because it is a uh, custom built application it's not based on another product um, it is built on top of Ubuntu, but um, but yeah, um, uh, yes, Tony. Uh, the, the Uptime Kuma is uh, it should work on on uh, the Synology NAS on Docker without an issue, so far as I know. I don't think there's anything in it that's processor architecture specific. I think it's I think it's built on top of 
Python or JavaScript or, or something like that, that's, that's uh, processor architecture agnostic. So um, I, I will be interested to hear your thoughts on it if you get it going. Okay, so uh, you boot to a desktop for Fox clone and you have the application here on the desktop. And opens up. It's going to read your drives. And so you select the drive you want to back up. And you select the partitions. And then you select your destination drive. So I'll say that. And that's not currently formatted, so that's not going to let me do it. But that's okay for this particular instance we don't need to go further uh, so backup restore is a similar layout uh, you can clone from one drive to another so this may in fact drive to drive go from SDA to SDB and we can clone it's got a verify option uh, a few settings for compression and this is uh, written by Andy Hardwick and Larry Hale. Um, and is written in Object Pascal using the Lazarus development environment. And this was put out on August 22nd of this year. So it is the most recent version. But again, if we click clone. Uh, warning target drive will be overwritten this is this is my first uh, time going through this so yeah uh, it's gonna do its thing and it's uh, now granted I've not updated the drives in my Proxmox machine yet so <laughs> I've got the drives, I just haven't got them in the machine yet. Um, so this is going to take a while. This is saying nine minutes. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, overall, yeah, nine minutes and 22, 8.55. So it's, it's going down pretty decent, but it's these drives are not fast. So... Um, for cloning, that I suppose this isn't a uh, isn't a bad utility to have in your uh, arsenal of of tech tools. Um, this is the very first testing I've done with it because I just heard of the project today. So um, your mileage may vary. I will likely do a a uh, video on this in the future. Um, I might, uh, do a comparison video to redo or not redo rescue, um, to rescue Zilla as far as the drive cloning operation goes and run the same clone procedure in both and see which one is faster on the same, um, on the same machine. So that would be kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, Fox Clone. Uh, again, this is something I just heard of today. Um, their website is pretty basic, and uh, yeah, little terms of use, but not bad. So. Uh, it is 12.29. My goal was to be finished by 12.30. So we are right on schedule. Uh, and with that, I want to thank everybody for coming out. If you have not done so already, I'd appreciate a like and a subscribe for any new folks out there uh, still watching. And... Uh, 
the plan is to be back in two weeks and we will we will continue down the road of looking at some new things and some news and whatnot and uh, keep this channel moving forward so on that note thank you all for coming out and um, I will see you in the next video have a great day